the message I'm doing today is how to be thankful when life is unfair because I think this is seriously, and, and a lot of you know what I'm talking about. When I was a counselor professionally, it was interesting because November and December were terrible. Y'all that are in business of your own, you know, there, there's times where you have cycles where you, November and December were terrible because everybody was spending their money on gifts and and trying to figure out how to hang out with their in-laws and and all of that other kind of stuff. But what would happen is the stress of Thanksgiving to Christmas was so great that in January, I wouldn't make enough money counseling to completely make up for November and December. And most of it had to do with some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, just the way families interact and the, and, and the, the pain that they cause each other and all that. I'm going to use a passage from 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you want to go there, I'll have it on your notes, and I'm going to read it to you off the screen here if you want. Let's go to that, uh, Danae. Uh, this is 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 18. And by the way, Peter is writing this to uh, pretty new Christians. Christianity's only been around for about... 30 years, and, uh, and they're greatly being persecuted. Nothing like you would ever possibly think of. The, the, they're martyrs like crazy and, and everything else during this time. So Peter's writing this letter, and, and, and here's what he says, starting with verse 13. He says, Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain, <coughs> explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. First thing I've got on your notes there is that that people, we have a tendency to say, hey, that's not fair. That's just not right. We, we want things to be fair, and we want things to go the way we want them to go, but, but, but we only really want fairness if it leans toward us. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, like how many times has something happened and, and, and you got the best out of it and you know this really wasn't fair. That guy really deserved this. You know, we've all experienced that, but we don't normally complain about that, right? But we do complain about things not being fair. We, we, we complain about good things happening to bad people. You know, and, and we complain about bad things happening to good people. You know, we, we know good people that die way before their time. We know good people that lose their jobs. We know good people that get cancer. We know good people. And then we see these bad people who we look at that we believe are living these terrible lives and, and everything seems to be going right for them. We, we get upset because we didn't get that promotion or, or he hit me first. You know, we, we say, you know, we, Nick came in one time and, and uh, he said, Brooke hit me after I hit her. You know what I'm saying? We, we, there's this, we, we lose the people we love. We, we, we're faithful spouses, but we get cheated on. We've got this dream that we've had our whole life and it's just never come through. We, we, we work twice as hard as the other guy and he got the promotion. And, and then this one is a counselor I saw over and over and over again. The good kid in the family... Always getting the short end of the stick. The good kid in the family is, 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 is always getting the short end because you know why? The bad kid in the family, the parents are working hard to try to help that kid be okay and make it in life and all that other kind of stuff. It just, it just doesn't seem fair. It's just not fair. Listen to this verse. This is 1 Peter 3, 9. I don't think I have it on your notes. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. That just doesn't seem right, does it? That just doesn't seem fair. If he did it first, it, but but what we've got to what we've got to realize that fairness, fairness is in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? 
I mean, what seems fair to you may not seem fair to me, and what seems fair to me may not seem fair to you. And, and we've got to realize this when we, when we look at things from a fairness point of view, we've got to realize that fairness is something that's very, very, very subjective. And there's only one person that can truly make a fair decision. Because he knows all, he sees all, he knows everything that's going on, he knows all the big picture, and you just know the small picture. And that's God. And again, if you're, if you're dealing with life being unfair, you can just, you know, I, I was listening to it in the, I was listening to it with, with the whole thing that just went on with Hostess, and they were interviewing this guy that was a, a union boss, and, and, and he just, he just the, guy, the, the guy I was interviewing was going, look, but you are going to lose your jobs. And the guy goes, yeah, but they're cheating us on this. And he goes, yeah, but you're going to lose your jobs. And he was just, uh, and in their mind, this other thing was so fair that they were about to lose everything they had because they believed that they weren't being treated fairly. Well, most likely the top dogs at Hostess thought they were being fair and they thought they weren't being. Again, it's subjective. And, 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 and we, we look at it that way and, and we've got to realize if, if we get to the point in our life where we understand truly that God is God and that Jesus is Lord of our lives, all of a sudden it becomes much easier to be, contentment with, be contented with what must be fair because God is the one in charge. How do we deal with life when it's unfair? We, we, we just have to realize that, that what's fair to one is not fair to the other. God says this. People say, why, hey, that's not fair. God says, look, I am always just. Always. I always have the good of the plan in mind. I, I always have what's best for you down the road. It may not seem what's best for you right now, but I have what's best for you down the road. Look at Galatians 6. Verses 7 and 8, and it's interesting. It, it just seems like the last few weeks, every time we study something that, that has to do with us not seeing things the way we're supposed to see things, the way God wants us to see things, we realize that the devil gets involved. And it's all about, it's all about deceiving us. It's all about trying to make us believe something against what God wants us to be. It's all about tricking us. And even here in Galatians, what's the first three words? Don't be misled. Who's he talking about? Who would mislead you? The devil. The devil would mislead you. The, the devil would trick you. The devil would manip manipulate you. The devil would make you believe that, that this thing must absolutely be right because surely God wants me to enjoy my life and, and surely God would want me to have this after working so hard all these years and surely God would want me to do this because, because of all this stuff that I've been All of this, and, and we look at it and we look at it with our idea of fairness and, and Paul writes, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Remember we talked about the, uh, a couple of weeks ago the, the verse that's always misused, that God will give me the strength to do all things. And we said, you know, people take that out of, out of context. And context is, are you living your life the way you're supposed to be living your life? Because if you are, you'll see things the way God wants you to see things, and you'll understand the way God wants you to understand things. But what happens is, is when you're constantly out here, when we're constantly out here deciding to do things according to our old sinful nature, remember the old sinful nature didn't go away. We just gained victory over it. And we have to choose on a minute-by-minute, -minute, choice by choice basis. Am I choosing the victory or am I choosing to go with the sinful nature? If I continue, remember this book to le this letter to the to Galatians, it, this is a letter to Christians. He's not writing this to people that aren't Christians. He's writing this to Christians, and he says, look, if you'll let the old nature that you still have, even though you've been, been reborn, it's going to cause decay and death, separation from God. But, he says, those who live to please the Spirit will what? Will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. We've got that choice all the time. You know, I, we, 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 we kind of keep, we, we try to keep our, oftentimes our spiritual life separated from all the other things that we're doing in life. And, 
And, and we've got to realize that it's all choice after choice after choice after choice after choice. And we know Romans 8, 28. We know that God takes everything and he makes them work together for the good for those who what? There's a context. Who love God. Who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we know in verse 29 it goes on to say that his purpose for us is to become more holy. Is to become more like Christ. So when that happens, when unfair things happen, we can actually be thankful for unfair things. Now in our mind this doesn't seem fair, but we know that God's a good God. So this must be just and it must be right. And it's to make us more holy. We think, you know, usually if I go about doing life the way I'm supposed to do life, things are going to work out. But work out according to what? According about the way you've been maybe misled or according to the way God wants to work things out. I promise you, it will always work out the way God wants to work things out. So let's look at just some points from this passage in, in 1 Peter. Number one, if we're going to deal with the unfair life, and, and we're going to be able to be content with that. If, if we're going to, we've got to remember that we are blessed. We've got to always remember that we are blessed. Always. You know, I, I, I talk to people all the time, and, 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 and even when times are tough, you know, they'll tell me, you know, Roy, when I, when I got to the point where I just stopped worrying about this and realized that I'm blessed, and what's weird now, this is going to sound weird, but people that are hurting the most end up seeing their blessings easier than people that aren't hurting as bad. Let me say that again, because I see people in their deathbed. I see people who know that they've got maybe months to live. I see people that are... And they see their blessings. It's, it's almost like, it's almost with the great pain and with the resolve of turning it over to God and know that I'm turning it over to God, there, there becomes a clarity of seeing the things that we should have been grateful for. The people that are just fussing, it's way harder to see the blessings. They're, they're a lot harder to counsel too. You just want to slap them upside the head sometimes. I'll just tell you that doesn't work, but it feels good to do that. Not that I've ever experienced that myself, but remember that you are blessed. Remember that you are blessed. But even if you suffer, he's writing this. And remember, remember the stuff that we've talked about that's going on. These people are being treated so terribly that they just they're hated. Christians are hated. They, by law, you can treat a Christian terrible. I mean, that's what these guys are living for. And, and they've got to be thinking, you know what? We signed up to follow Jesus and our life has changed and we're, we've changed everything. We're not following these gods anymore. We're doing the things that God... We sit around and we listen to the disciples and we obey and we go out and we're generous with our money and we do everything. There's, there's got to come a point where some of these guys are going, God, this just isn't fair. My life was better before I became a Christian. And he's saying, look, even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. There might be somebody in this room that's lost a job before because you decided you were going to do the right thing instead of the thing that the boss told you to do. I don't mean the right thing as in you think you should spend your money here or whatever, but as in what the boss has told me to do is wrong and moral and unethical, and I've decided not to, and you've lost your job because of that. Even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for that. James 1.12 God blesses those who what? Patiently endure testing and temptation. You know, temptation's not a sin. It's the step right before. And we think about temptation, we think like tempted to eat extra chocolate. You know, or, or tempted to have an affair or tempted to whatever. Look, anytime... Anytime you're tempted to even think something against what God would want you to do or how God would want you to think, you're, 
you're being tempted. The, the cool thing about temptation is, is the closer you are to God, the easier you see the temptation, and the more you can use the temptation itself. See, it's way better to go, oh, that's a temptation. Uh, I can't do that than to go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And the closer we are to God, the easier it is to go, temptation, temptation, temptation. And then we don't suffer the consequences of, of the sin afterwards. As a matter of fact, there will be strength that will come to you as you, as, you, as you patiently endure the testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised. And again, there's a promise and here's a premise. You ready? For those who love him. For those who love him. So we need to be thankful for the tests, and we need to be we we know that the reward is coming, and and uh, uh, and, 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 and and you know you could go years, but the Bible says if you're truly seeking God out, part of the ability to deal with the temptation and the problems will be the patience that comes with being close to God. So number two, you ready? Let it go and let God. Let it go and let God. Verse 14b, don't worry or be afraid of their threats. These, these, this worrying that we do, some of us sit around and we worry so much we, that, that, we just, that we just become miserable. You know, we, we, uh, uh, I love it when my grandbaby comes over. And sometimes I'm in the middle of being miserable. Not because the grandbaby's there, but before. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you, you get, and, and I don't know what it is about when my grandbaby comes over, but I can be just flat out sorry, miserable, and as soon as she smiles and says, hey, da, I can immediately turn that around and change that. Because it's the way we think. It's, it's what we decide is most important. And if we do that same thing all the time with God, then it becomes easier to just let that go. As, as we gain our confidence... As we gain our confidence in our relationship with God, then, then we also gain a, 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 a consistency and a purity in our faith that will lead us to contentment and that patience that we were talking about. We're God's kids, and what we've got to realize all the time is that God has and wants what is best for us, and He wants to use anything that happens. Instead, look at verse 15a. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So, again, if we're, if we're close to God when worry or something happens, and it, worry, is a, worry is a temptation. When, when that comes into our life, when we're close to God, we can, and if we recognize that, we, we can immediately, our antenna can go up and go, oh, this is something that we've got to change. But, but we've got to realize what we've got to do is instead of worshiping the thing that we're worrying about, we've got to turn our worship around and, and focus on God. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Do you ever think about what that means? I mean, do you ever think about if if if... Most Christians, if, if, you, if they would ask you something like, why are you a Christian? What does that mean that you're a Christian? We would say something like, well, we love Jesus. Jesus Christ died for us. Somebody would even say, even though this is a word that's not used very often today, somebody would say, well, Jesus is Lord of my life. And that's a good answer. But it also shows how short you are if Jesus is not Lord of your life. Is Jesus Lord of your life? If Jesus is Lord of your life, then every decision you make will be based on what you think Jesus would be interested in or what you think Jesus would do. Or is this going to please Jesus or is it going to upset Jesus? Is, is this going to be something that will bring great joy to Jesus or is this going to bring sadness to Jesus? And in this verse, this 15a, this, this is probably the heart of, of Christianity as far as what's expected of me as a believer no matter what as a believer what I want to do is I want to worship Christ as Lord of my life I've got to make that personal commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord of your life I've got to believe in him and desire to serve him and agree to obey him we, anywhere I go anything I do I'm going to go and do what he wants if he says for me to celebrate then I'm going to celebrate if he says for me to endure suffering then at this season of my life I'm going to endure suffering the center of my life is no longer resolved, reserved for anything else except Jesus Christ 
So the question for you, before we even go on to question three, and the next part three is, is that a decision that you've made? Is, is, just, is God just something that you know is inevitable and he's there and you recognize him? Or is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Because that's what it's really all about. Number three, God is developing you into holiness. That's God's desire for you. You know, I get excited when I see my kids succeed at things. You know, I, 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 when, when I can look back, because I've got a, a kid now that's almost 30, and Nick's just a few years behind, and, and as I watch them succeed here and succeed there and do this and do that and handle this situation this way and whatever part of the processing that goes inside inside of my mind is 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 are they are they acting the way i hope that they would be developed i mean that's what we do as a parent that's our number one job and and you know there are parents that just ignore that and pull away from that one of the saddest things i ever hear parents say is is uh you, you know i i I, I don't care what religion he decides. I'm just going to let him go and, and decide. And you're going to go, what? You call yourself a Christian? You know, that's like saying, I'm not going to tell him to stay out of the highway. He'll figure that out. You know, it's, it's dangerous. And, and, and we've got to realize that what Jesus is doing, what God is doing with us constantly, and, and everything we do, he's, he's developing a holiness in us. He's, he's, he's trying to teach us. He wants to teach us to not be prideful, but to be humble. He's, he's trying to teach us not to rely on the things of the world, but to rely on Him. It, and it's, it's constantly working on it. And what holiness means, y'all know what holiness means? Holiness means to be used by God. See, I don't know why it is, but, but the, we've grown up in the church believing that there are certain people who it's their job to be used by God. The priests, the nuns, the, the pastor, the associate pastor, the whatever, the deacons, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever you grew up in, whatever. Look, we're all supposed to be there. We need holy everywhere. We need you being who God wants you to be in all those situations. God is developing us. And, and there's that Romans 8, 29 passage I mentioned to you a minute ago. Look at number four. We've also got to learn to share our experience. And I like to call this our budology. And if you've never heard me say that before, the first time I ever taught budology was at First Baptist Church, Colleyville. And afterwards, a dad came up and said, my child leaned over to me and said, we're not allowed to say that in our house. Budology, budology is, is a, I, the reason I like budology is because people can argue with your theology. All you got to do is get online and you start talking about Jesus Christ and everybody wants to argue with you. But nobody can argue with this. I once was this, but now because of Christ, I'm this. Do y'all have a budology? You know, sometimes after Thanksgiving, our budology is a little bit bigger. But, but do, you, <laughs> do, you have, is your, do you have life change? Can you say to people, you know, that's something I used to really worry about, but I don't, I don't have to worry about that, or, or, or this is the way that my life has changed, and, and, and we've got to learn to, we've got to learn to, 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 uh, to share that with other people, not just our theology, but our butology. Look what it says, we're supposed to be living our lives in holiness and everything, and then if someone asks about our Christian hope, we should always be ready to explain it. Now, now, did I put a blank on there for butology? You might write beside their theology, too. You need to know your theology. And one of the main reasons you need to know your theology is so you can share it truthfully with people. But the other thing you, reason you need to know your theology is when somebody is a false teacher, you can go, no, that's not right. Or no, you're, when people tell you they're a Christian, but you look at their theology, you can go, you know, that's not what Christianity is all about. So share your experience. Number five, focus on Christian purity. And I'm not talking about sex before marriage here. I'm talking about living your life in a way, in a way of integrity that you are focusing on in everything you do, in every section of your life, your work life, your play life, your family life, whatever life, you focus on being the kind of Christian that you're supposed to be. Look what it says. He says, he, in 15, he says, be sure to share your, your hope. Explain that. And then he says, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your what? Conscience clear. 
Let me tell you something. When you see Christians yelling at other people because they're not Christian, when, when you see Christians very nervous and, and angry, and I want to tell you something. I would say they've probably got a problem with their conscience. You know, when you, when, you see, when you see a guy on the left politically and a guy on the right politically, and they're sitting at a table and they're having a, supposedly a, a civil debate, and one of them starts yelling and overpowering the other one, you can just about promise you that this one is not as confident in himself as this one. Because confidence, it, it, there's going to be a peace and a calm that comes with confidence. You're going to be able to come at people in a gentle and respectful way because you're not going to think that they're after you because, be, because of your faith. You're going to feel comfortable in who you are. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be the ones who be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Integrity will give you a security in your faith. I, t I talk to people all the time, and, and, I, and, and I guarantee you, we could, we could take a small group of people right now, and we could go out here and do some kind of Bible study, and, and I would ask a question like, you know, why do you think people have such a hard time sharing their faith? And you know what they usually give me first? Uh, I'm not sure that I know the theology. Well, first of all, if you've been a Christian for a while, shame on you for not knowing that. But, but second of all, that's not really the answer. The real answer is, are you confident in what you do? Are, are you confident? Are, are, you be, are you able to, to tell people that? It, do you have the integrity for that? And number six, I don't know how else to say this, but you just got to grow up and deal with the pain. I mean, is the way you're dealing with pain right now, is that working for you? Probably not if you're not doing it the way God wants you to deal with the pain. If, if, if you're not making Jesus Christ Lord of your life. If, he, says, he says, remember, it's better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants, then to suffer for doing wrong. This should be the Christ follower's approach to life. As Christians, we're committed to do what's right, no matter what. We are com should be committed to make the right choice. And, we've got to re and part of the right choice is just learning to deal with that pain. Like I said, there are just things that you can't control. You can't control that brother who acts so sorry. And no matter how much you are, look, look, the more upset you get, the better they feel about themselves. Have you noticed that? You know, you get so upset and, and so crazy and you're burning up eating inside and they're just going on. Look, if they're that kind of jerk already, they don't care. Life is good for me and it makes me feel so good when you, it's eating your lunch. Y'all, there's several of y'all that are going to be dealing with that this time of year. I guarantee you. You probably already did it Thursday. You probably wanted to shove somebody's head in the rear end of a turkey so bad and you just couldn't stand it. But, but, but that's what happens. And, and you, just like when I'm, dealing with, you know, when I'm dealing with a couple that's separated and, and, and this one's trying to fix it. You know how they try to fix it? They try to fix it by yelling the person back into it. It doesn't work that way. That's one of the reasons they're running. You're just convincing them that that affair is the right thing to do. You do it with love. You do it with forgiveness. You deal it with dealing with the pain with your relationship with Christ. You just got to learn to deal with it. Unjust suffering is always better than deserved punishment. Sometimes, maybe even for some of us a lot of times, God will let you suffer. And he lets you suffer because you grow more into holiness. The potential to grow more into holiness is so much greater during the suffering than it is during the good times. No pain, no gain. That's true in spiritual growth as it is in physical growth. And you've got to remember that God knows what's best. God knows what's best. Last one, number seven. Make Jesus your role model. Now, it's kind of cool that this section ends with this verse because Jesus literally, Jesus makes the unfair become fair. 
Remember, Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Remember, the Bible says that Jesus is a great high priest because he knows what it's like to, to live our life the way that we live our life. And, and, uh, uh, and he knows what it's like to, to follow God even when it's hard to follow God. He knows what it's like to obey God even when it's tough to obey God. Look at verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. I mean, speaking of theology... Because when, when you hear a lot of arguments on theology, sometimes they can argue things, and, and you think that those things aren't that important. You know, people will go, well, Mary wasn't a virgin. Well, that's not that important. Well, Jesus wasn't really the Son of God. Joseph with his dad. Look, if that's one of those things you're just throwing off, it's important for you to realize Mary was a virgin and she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You know why that's so important? Sins are passed down from the Father. Mary wasn't perfect either, although there are some faiths that will teach that. Mary was just somebody who was trying to live a pure life for God, and she got picked to do a very holy thing. But she wasn't perfect. Mary had sin in her life. Look, the Holy Spirit made Mary pregnant. The, the Father of Jesus did not have any sin to pass down. So Jesus was born out of, you know, we're born into sin. Because sins pass down from generation to generation. Jesus was not. And then people say, well, Jesus sinned. And, and yeah, Jesus messed around with Mary Magdalene. And yeah, you read these things in fiction books and all this other kind of stuff. And you, and you think, well, that's wrong too. That's wrong. It was important that Jesus stayed pure because he was making that sacrifice. And he could do that because he was born in holiness and he was born pure. And he lived his life that way. He went through being a kid. He went through being an adolescent. He went through, he went through growing up in a town where everybody thought that his, that his mom was immoral because she got pregnant before his mom and dad got married. He lived through all that stuff, the Bible says, without any sin. So you want to talk about fair. And then he died the most brutal death for us who not only are we born into sin, it's natural for us to like sin. Talk about unfair. No matter what kind of pain you're going through in your life, I'm not devaluing it because it's pain. I know what pain is all about. But we can't say it's not fair. Because we're not God. What we can say is God is a just God and he has a plan and he has a plan for all of us. And, and, and all of this stuff that we go through and everything, it all falls under that big picture of the plan. And then one day, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, we're going to be in a place where there's no more pain. There's no more sickness. There's no more arguing. There's no more angry brothers. There's no more bosses that cheat you. There's everybody loves everybody. And the focus of everybody is not getting back at each other, but on loving the Father purely because we will be in a place where there's no sin. If we have the premise that goes with the promise. The premise is that you believe in Jesus Christ and you commit to making him Lord and Savior of your life. That's the premise. So let's go into our time with God.